Hello everyone, today I want to talk to you about how we deal with fears and insecurities. Now, perhaps you are going through a very difficult time right now, struggling with trying to deal with terrible trials that are coming into your life, troubling situations that are coming into your life. And, and what I want to talk to you about is from Psalm 46, and we want to get some counsel from God's Word. How do we handle ourselves during a very difficult time. Now you'll see the title here, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And, and for those of you that are familiar, this is a hymn written by Martin Luther. And it is said that Psalm 46 was the background, uh, the passage that he used in order to deal with uh, trials in his life. And it was the psalm that he used as the background for a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. He would often say to his friend, let us go and pray the 46th, because he knew that there were truths in this psalm that would help him to deal with the trials and troubles that would happen in life. So, so as you're dealing with struggles, what I want you to consider today is the counsel that we can get from this psalm, and I want you to think through that prayerfully. So as we get to this passage, I want you to consider certain truths. And there's a key principle I want you to think about. And here's the key principle. In the midst of terrible, terribly troubling times, anchor yourself to the unchangeable God. In the midst of terribly troubling times, anchor yourself to the unchangeable God. The thing about it is, is that we have no control of the things that are happening around us. What we do have control of is what's happening within us in the way we think and how we speak and how we act. Those are so important to us. We have a tendency to want to control events and circumstances outside of us, and we cannot. And I want you to think about the fact that God is a God who is unchangeable in his character, unchangeable in who he is. And that is how we need to anchor ourselves. So Psalm 46, let's read the psalm together, and then we will come back and talk a little bit about some of the principles that are here. Psalm 46, this is the word of the Lord. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamoth, a song. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her. When the morning dawns, the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. This is the sufficient, eternal, authoritative, life-giving, and life-changing word. Let it implant its work in our hearts today. Would you pray with me? So, Father, today as we, as we talk through Psalm 46, I pray that you would help us to see that you are our mighty fortress. And, Father, I don't know what the troubles and the trials are. I don't know what the terribly troubling times are. But I pray that you would remind us that we need to anchor ourselves to the fact that you are the unchangeable God. Thank you for the blessing that you've given us in Christ. Thank you for, for the blood brought work that he did for us on the cross of Christ. Thank you for the empty tomb. And thank you so much for the fact that Jesus Christ is seated at your right hand right now, even interceding for his believers. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is the author of Scripture, and he is now hopefully going to take that word that 
we hear and implant it deep into our hearts. And I pray that you're going to be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' matchless, holy, and powerful name we pray. Amen. Well, this psalm breaks into uh, three specific sections. Uh, The first one through three makes up our first section, and that is that God is for us, and he alone is our refuge. God is for us, and he alone is our refuge. And that verse one says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse one. And the psalmist begins by giving us a strong affirmation of faith. He said, God is. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. But what he begins with is that the fact that there is a God. God is. And so oftentimes what we have a tendency to do is we get so caught up in the things that are wrapping around us. And what we need to do is to be able to sense the fact that God is. He always has been, he always will be, and he's with you right now, especially if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's certain things that are so important in understanding as we make this affirmation of faith. And and one of my favorite books is um, Jerry Bridges' book, Trusting God. And in that book, he talks about how we deal with troubling situations in our lives. And he, he focuses on three aspects of God's character that I think are so important. His, his changeless character in these three areas. God does not change in these three areas. One, he does not change in the fact that he's absolutely sovereign. He is absolutely and totally in control of everything that happens. There is not a molecule in this universe that's outside of his control. There are some people that want to believe that there are, there are things that are happening in this world that God cannot control. He would want to be able to control them, but he can't. And so he is seated, seated back, and he's a loving God. He's a gracious God, but he cannot control the events that happen in their lives. And, and to be honest, they believe that that brings them comfort. That brings me no comfort at all. And it actually goes against Scripture. What we find is that God is sovereignly in control of everything that happens. He ordains everything that comes to pass, but he does it in such a way that it does not rob humanity of their will to choose. That some people will do some terribly horrific things, and that God, even in his sovereignty has allowed for those things to happen. But what God can do is he can take those negative things, those sinful things, those terrible things, and he can bring about good. That that God can cause all things to work together for good. And in Genesis 50, 20, um, Joseph is talking to his brothers and he says, you intended this for evil, but, but God intended it for good. And if you remember the story, the story how they had tricked their brother and thrown him into a cave and then thought about killing him and then sold him into slavery and all the things that happened in Joseph's life. He was wrongly accused of rape. He was imprisoned for years. And all of those things were under the sovereign hand of God and that Joseph could get it to the end of his life, near the end of his life and say that, you know what, what you did, you intended this for evil, but God could intend it for good. Satan we um, took in the book of Job horrific attacks against Job, once again, sovereignly ordained, that God would use those attacks to bring about his glory in Job's life and through Job's life. And then, of course, we see the horrific work that was done against the Lord Jesus Christ and that God could take the humanity's sin against Christ and be even nailing him to a cross and bring about the greatest rescue mission ever happening. So as you go through this time, I need you to recognize that God is absolutely sovereign. Second, I need you to recognize that he's infinitely wise. We want to trust in our own wisdom, but the Bible tells us oftentimes that our thoughts are not as high as God's thoughts. Our ways are not as good as God's ways. That God doesn't just know the past perfectly, and he doesn't just know the present perfectly. He knows the future perfectly. We, we at best have a, a, a sense of the past and at best have a sense of the present, and we can't know the future in totality, but God does. And so one of the things that we can trust in as we go through these troubling trials in our lives, these testings in our lives, is to know that God is for us and he alone is our refuge in the fact that 
He's infinitely wise. He's allowing you to go through this for a reason. The third thing that Bridges gets to, not only are we, uh, is God absolutely sovereign, and not only is he infinitely wise, but he is perfectly loving. That for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God loves you with an everlasting love. What it actually says is that God loves you as he loves his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is mind-blowing to think about the fact that the father loves his children the same way that he loves his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you go through these trials, there are some that would give you the impression that God is not in control, sovereign, that he is not wise in allowing this, and that he does not love you, that the reason why you're going through these troubling trials is the fact that God doesn't love you and there's nothing further from the truth. God loves you, and that he wants to take you through this time to bring about greater glory in your life and greater transformation in your life so that you can be a reflection to him in a lost and a dying world. So we begin this psalm by starting with this affirmation of faith. I want you to go back to this verse, and he says not only is God is, the affirmation of faith, but then he says he gives you some arguments for that faith. He says, God is our refuge, our strength, our very present help in trouble. So he gives you the arguments for the faith. God is, and then now he's going to explain why. And he says this, that God is first our refuge. It's a fortress. Back in these biblical times, the way you would protect your city is to build a wall around that city, a refuge, a fortress around that city. It's so important to protect yourselves. They did not have planes or nuclear bombs or uh, or tanks at that time whatever refuge we go to today they didn't have that what they had was a walled city and when they would think about protection they would go behind that wall and so the psalmist is saying that you know what god is our ultimate refuge he's not just a, a physical refuge a wall that could be penetrated. He is a God who is the ultimate source of refuge. He cannot be penetrated. You know, um, back in Old Testament times as well, they would have these cities of refuge. And those that were presumed guilty of doing some crime could run to the city of refuge for protection. And in some ways, that's exactly what we are called to do, that we are truly guilty outside of Christ. We are sinners who desperately need a Savior, and we can run to this city of refuge for help and hope. But not only is God our refuge, God is our strength. Oftentimes, when we are going through troubling trials and anxious times, we find ourselves weak. You remember what Paul said? He says, um, God has not given you a spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, and a sound mind, going back to that power aspect. Um, or, or how about in Isaiah chapter 41, um, where it says in verse 10, Fear not, I am with you. Do not be anxious or afraid, dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Strength is desperately needed for those that are struggling with these trials. And, and God says, I am not only your refuge, I am your strength. And then finally, I am your very present help in trials. I love this. It is, it is actually the word very present is well-proved, ever-present provider. Think about those words. Well-proved. He has come through consistently. Ever-present. He is always with you and then provider he will help you so so the psalmist begins by giving the strong affirmation of faith and he says god is and then he says god is and then he gives an argument for that faith god is a refuge a strength the very present help in troubles now of course this is not an exhaustive list of who god is or an exhaustive list of what god does but specifically in these troubling trials these anxious times this is arguments for the faith that you need to have so god is is for you remind yourself of that he alone is your refuge he aff he affirms that he gives some arguments for that and then finally he says this god is a refuge and strength a very present help in times of trouble. Trouble. Severe afflictions. I, I don't know what the troubling situations are that you're going through right now. 
you could probably list them or maybe there's some physical things maybe there's emotional maybe there's mental issues maybe there's relational issues maybe you feel spiritually attacked i don't know what the troubling trial is maybe it's the world that's happening around you the wars the rumors of wars the the trials it may feel so overwhelming to you the psalmist in psalm 50 said and call upon me in days of trouble and i will deliver you and you shall glorify me Or Psalm 91, verse 15 says, When he called to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. It's so important for us as believers, when we're going through these troubles and these trials, to reach out to God. In in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, it says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces Um, character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us it's it's so important essential for us to be able to think through these trials whatever they are and what I want you to do is to take your journal and to write down whatever these troubling trials are and I want you to remind yourself of the affirmation of faith I want you to remind yourself of the argument of faith. And I want you to remind yourself this, that he wants you to call to him. And God will rescue you. And God will honor you. Trust him. Trust him so importantly. And then I want you to think about this passage in Psalm 46. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. He now goes to an application of faith. He began with the affirmation of faith, then he went to the arguments for his faith, now he applies the faith. He says, therefore, I will not fear. And how can he say that? Well, it's the solid logic of faith. See, if God is unchangeable and if God is absolutely sovereign infinitely wise perfectly loving and if God provides you a refuge a strength and very present help in times of trouble then we don't need to fear even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you God are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me What a precious promise that is. I don't know what the valley is that you're going through, but I want you to know that God is with you if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. How about this in Psalm 27, verse 1? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I need you to remind yourself of this, that God is is sometimes we go through what i call a gap theory and a gap theory is what we believe it's the gap between what we believe and how we live and the wider the gap is between what we believe and how we live the the greater the disharmony the greater the struggles are in our lives it's it's kind of like this you may believe that the bible is the word of god belief but you live in such a way where you don't open the word of god great gap And let's say you haven't opened the Bible in weeks. There's even a larger gap. And so the gap creates a greater level of discord and harmony in our lives. We may believe this verse technically, but do we live out this verse practically? Maybe some of us have developed a what-if mindset, this catastrophic thinking. What if this happens? What if that happens? And we're going all over the place, reminding ourselves and fearful of the things that are happening around us. Do you struggle with a what-if mindset? What if this? What if that? I want you to change the what-if mindset into even-if mindset. Even if this happens, even if the great upheavals and the cataclysmic events happen in our lives, even if, and applying the affirmation of faith. God is. And applying the arguments of faith. A refuge, a strength, a very present help in troubles. And how do I do that? 
See, if the earth becomes disordered, what did the verse say? The verse had said that the even if the earth gives way, if the earth becomes disordered, God is. If, if the mountains become dislodged, let's say the mountains were picked up and thrown into the heart of the sea thousands of miles away, God is. And if, if the oceans become disturbed, God is. And so as we remind ourselves of this, we, we move from the catastrophic thinking. I wondered why it was that he chose the earth, the mountain, and the oceans to describe this struggle. And I think part of the reason was this. These are symbols of stability in our lives. The, the earth, the mountains, the oceans, they're, they're a symbol of permanence. The same ground, in essence, that is now in Israel is the same ground that Jesus walked. The same Alps with some change, but the same Alps are the same Alps as Jesus' time. The same Rockies are the same Rockies. The same uh, Appalachian Trail is the same as it was in general. Those mountains are there, and they've been fixed, and there may be some surface changes, but they've been there, and they're a symbol of stability and permanence. They're fixed. And so if the most stable things in this world, the most permanent things in this world become shaken, we don't have to because God is. And so what he's doing is he's, he's arguing in some ways from the greater to the lesser, the greater in this, that, that if all of those things become disordered, dislodged, disturbed, the, mount, the earth, the mountains, the oceans, and that God still is infinitely wise, absolutely sovereign, and perfectly loving, I can handle life. Is that who you believe in today? I want you to think about this. He had this word, sila. It's an interesting word. We don't completely know what the word means, but what we think is it's a musical term or a liturgical term. And it, what it would mean is that you would need to pause for a moment. You would take some time to pause. Maybe the psalmist would read the section and then all of a sudden the music in the background would play and you would just have to think, ponder, roll this around in your mind, think deeply about this, meditate on the fact that God is. Meditate on the fact, the affirmation of your faith. Meditate on the fact of the arguments for your faith. Meditate on the fact of the application of your faith. God is. Well, the first section began with this. God is for us, and he alone is our refuge. But the second section of this, God is with us. Listen to these verses, and it goes this way. Here's this passage. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. It's interesting that the land here for the people, they did not have a major river source. And it's one of the things that you would actually build your cities. You tended to build your cities near a river source. Why? Because you needed water for your survival. And what this passage is saying is that God is the river of his people. God is the stream of his people. You remember I'd said that um, earlier we had talked about part of the way you would protect your city is by building a fortress or a refuge around it. Another way is to build it near a water source, a river. And part of the way you would conquer a city is to cut off its water supply and then climb its walls. Well, here the psalmist is saying that God is the river, the stream. And it goes all the way back to the very first psalm. You remember that, that he talked about building, uh, having a tree planted by the streams of water. It's this, this idea that we are going to be nourished and flourish and, and we are going to be fruitful because we're connected to God. That God is a river for us in the city of God, Zion, his place, where we are supposed to, to live in, in God's home in perfect peace. This is where we want to be desperately today. How is he preserving us? Well, he's providing the water supply. We talked about it. There is a river 
whose streams make glad the city of God. It reminds me of this passage from Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. See, God is the God-given supply. He, he brings life. He, he comes, life comes from God because he's the God of life. He's the fountain of life. He's the river of life. See, God has given us his covenant promises. He has given us his blessing. And he's a constant supply of water in our lives. You remember back in, in the Exodus where Moses was called to speak to a rock and then he was called to strike a rock in order to get water from the rock. And if you remember, Paul had said in 1 Corinthians that the water from that rock was Christ. And then what he says is, not only has he given us a river, but that river makes us glad. It's, it's joyous. There's, there's no external circumstances that can alter or change this river that God has given us. That we have a well-being among his people. And what we need to recognize is that God is constant. The waters may be roaring, it may be foaming, the rivers may be overwhelming us, but God is a river whose streams make glad. It's See the contrast in the verses. The waters are roaring and foaming around us, but we have a river that makes us glad that God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. It's so important because God is not only preserving us, but God is present with us. You need to know that God is ever present with you because he says that God is in the midst of her, in the midst of his people. He indwells us. It's like the Shekinah glory of God, that he was there with his people. One pastor talked about the fact that his people, God's people, were indestructible when he was in the midst of them. Isn't that so true? That as you read the Old Testament, when they would go to battle with God in the center of them, they could not be defeated. It was only when they went ahead of God, or they chose to go without God, that they found themselves destroyed. It was when the glory of God had departed Ichabod. I just read that just the other day. God promises you his personal presence. He promises you his preserving presence in your life. And so it is so important that when you know that God is in the midst of her, the result is that she shall not be moved. We are steadfast. We're not shaken. We're stable. There's a continuity that is there. I need you to know that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is indestructible because God is in the midst of her. And even as the mountains seem to be quaking, as the earth seems to be shaking, as the world seems to be uh, going overboard, I need you to remind yourself that God is in the midst of you. You shall not be moved. He says, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. But then he makes another promise. God will help her when the morning dawns. So important. God is not only um, preserving her, and God is not only present with her, but God is providing for us in the perfect time. It's interesting that this verse talks about the fact that God will help her, and that God will help her in the midst of the troubling trials that are happening in life. God will help her. And God will help her, and meaning that he will be there for you to deal with the struggles and the trials that are happening in your life. I need you to remind yourself that Jesus can calm a storm. He is in the boat, and the, and the disciples in Mark chapter 4 are, are panicking, and they, they just do not know what to do. And, and Jesus says, peace be still. God was with them. And that when God is providing for us in the perfect time, I need you to know that God will help you. God will do that when the morning dawns. It's a metaphor for the perfect timing in life. That in Psalm 5, verse 3, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. That that God at the perfect time is there with you. I love this passage in Hebrews chapter 4. It goes this way. 
Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. See, see, God is never late. His timing is perfect. It may not be your timing. It may not be my timing. But he does it when the morning dawns. Perfect in timing. I need you to hear this in verse 6. It says this, The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. I don't know what the nations are raging around you. You turn on the news and and people are fighting politically or they're fighting verbally and they're just attacking one another. Maybe there's great fears that are happening as you listen to videos or listen to the news and and the nations are raging. But I, I need you to remind yourself of this. It's a voice that's not effective. Many of the fears and many of the things that they talk about just do not come true. They're not an effective voice. I need you to remind yourself of the voice of God. There's a song that talks about the fact that he speaks truth to you even as the world is lying to you. I need you to hear the voice of truth, the voice of God in your life. So what have we seen? We have seen that God is what? God is for you. So important. And he alone is your refuge. We've talked about the affirmation of faith and the arguments for faith. And we've talked about the application of faith. And then we looked at God is with you, and God is with you in preserving you. God is with you in being present with you, and that God is with you because what he's doing is he's providing for you in the perfect time. And now I need you to hear this, that God will fight for you. God will fight for you. It says this, Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he's brought desolations on the earth. And he gives two imperatives that's so important. Two imperatives that I need you to hear. Two imperatives, they're they're things that we are commanded to do. And he says, first, come and behold. See it? See the two? Come. He wants you to come to him and hear and see what God is doing. But it's not just come. He wants you to behold, see it. See with new eyes. See with the eyes of faith. And he talks about the works that God is doing. See, the goal of God in choosing his people out of this world is that he is going to rescue them and he's going to sustain them. That you can live at peace, but you need to come and behold his work in your life. Don't, Don't worry and get overwhelmed by the things that are happening around you. He's brought desolations on the earth, yes, but he's the one that will make wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Then he gives two more of those commandments. Now, now, as you're looking around, I want you to see all of the wars and, and the breaking of the bows, and you haven't seen it yet, but he's saying you need to see, come and behold with eyes of faith. Come and behold that God will rescue you. And how does he do that? He will make the war cease. This is not going to last forever. He will break the bow and he will shatter the spear. He will burn chariots with fire. But then that leads to two more imperatives. Come and behold and then be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still. I need you to recognize that we need to calm down. Now, I'm not sure. This seems like it's written in the plural, so it it may be to the nations or it may be to you, or maybe we're supposed to be echoing this through our lives, but we need to be still and you need to know. It goes back to the affirmation of faith and the arguments for faith, the application of faith. Be still and know that I am God. That God will be exalted among the nations. And God will be exalted in the earth. 
And that leads us to our last section I want you to think about today. There's this repeated verse, and if you notice, I skipped over verse 7 because it's repeated. The Lord of hosts is with us. Here's the passage. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Now remind yourself again, Selah means to, to take rest and to be at peace and remind yourself of these truths. Meditate on it. That the Lord of hosts, that means the God Almighty, is with you. The God of Jacob is your refuge. What a precious promise of God's presence with you. God is with you. And he is fighting for you. And you are safe in him. See, God promises that he is with you. He will never leave you. And then this is our great hope. That is where we need to rest today. So I I want you to think about this. Where are you placing your hope as we were going through these difficult times? See, God is for you. And God is with you. And God will fight for you. Is that the God that you're trusting in today? So I want you to think about this as we close. I want you to think about just some questions I want you to consider. What new thoughts have you had since reading and studying this or hearing me go through this. I I want you to actually read this passage multiple times. And what are some new things that have come out to you as we were talking about it? What verse from this psalm will you commit to meditating on and memorizing this week? And what I want you to do is write it down. And I want you to share it with others because other people are going through some of these trials. And I want you to bring this home. I need you to really ponder the psalm. We, we talked about sila. Roll it around in your mind and meditate on it. Think deeply about it. And I don't want you just to ponder this psalm. I want you to personalize it. What did you learn? How has your thinking, your beliefs, your values changed? How were they challenged in light of this psalm? What, what are any characteristics of your thinking or behavior that were ungodly, that were exposed as we read this psalm? How can you not only learn from this psalm, but how can you love? How can you love God more based on what you've learned from this psalm? And what are you going to do differently as you live out this psalm? See, it's so important to learn God's truth. Learn it. But you can't just simply learn about a person. You need to love them. Love them deeply. How is your thinking about God changed? How have you learned to love God more as a result of this and love love others selflessly as a result of this psalm? And then what are you going to do to live? See, it's, it's not good enough to hear a message. It's not good enough to read a psalm. You need to change. And, and maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to confess and admit, Lord, I, I have not been thinking this way or I've been allowing the things around me to overwhelm me. Lord, please forgive me. And, and maybe you need to ponder this psalm and personalize this psalm in such a way that you are going to take this deeply into your life. And then I want you to not just ponder the psalm, not just to personalize the psalm, but I want you to pray the psalm. There's an Acts acrostic that you may be familiar with, and, and it goes this way. You, you adore God, you confess, you thank him, and then you, su- you have supplications, prayer requests. So as you adore God, I want you to think about specific ways that I can pray, adoring God because of what I've learned in the psalm. How can I adore God for, for who he is and what he's done through this psalm? And how can I begin by praying that way? Or confession, what specific things do I need to confess based on what I've learned from this psalm? I need you to consider that. Or thanksgiving, what specific things do I need to thank God for based on what I've learned in this psalm? And then finally, what are some specific things I need to request in prayer, supplication, based on what I've learned in this psalm? God is. Please don't ever forget that. Let's pray. So, Lord, I I praise you and I thank you because you are, God is, 
I thank you for the affirmation of faith. I thank you for the fact that that faith has been given to us through the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. I praise you for that, that that we have been born again to a living hope. I praise you for that, Lord. And thank you for not only the affirmation of faith, but the arguments for faith that you are a refuge, our fortress, our ever-present help in times of trouble. You are strength. And Lord, help us to apply that faith that we will not fear, even if the world seems like a ghost chaotic. Help us to know that you never change. Lord, help us to remind ourselves not only of the fact that you're for us, but that you are present with us. You're with us. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of your preserving work and your present work in our lives. And I thank you for the fact that you provide for us in the perfect time. And Lord, thank you for the fact that you fight for us. You're our divine warrior. That we we need to come and behold. We need to be still and know that you've given us a precious promise. And it should be our ultimate hope. So today, help us to trust you. Turn our eyes upon Jesus. We look full into his wonderful face. And then the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Blessings.